Our love is ought to operate in the believer's life, in the Christian's life, in the life of the church amongst itself. And this is what caught me off guard as I just began to study this um, for the time that I have, is that all of the other times that I've heard this um, preached and taught and expounded, if you will, in terms of um, particularly chapter 13 and dealing, getting into the attributes of love, verses 4 through 7, we hear it a lot in various contexts, whether it be marriages, uh, you know, all, all types of, of, of contexts in which people will pull out these attributes of love to say, this is what we ought to do, this is what we ought to be. But when you bring it back to, to its context, when you come and you open up the scriptures and you see what Paul is doing, what he's doing is he is making a correction. He is, he is seeking to get the church to understand that first and foremost, this love, if it be in you, it ought to manifest among you as believers, as believers. So this is the divine priority I'm calling of the gifting of the body that, that Paul gets into. Look at, look at um, verse 27 again. He says, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then he begins to, uh, to give a listing, a listing of gifts, verses 28. And then he, he uh, poses some rhetorical questions, verses 29 through 30. The listing of these gifts are, are really important because what I see Paul doing is he's setting in order, in proper order, what God's priority in the giving of gifts are. Look at what he says again in verse 28. He says, and God has set some in the church first, that is first and foremost, firstly, or as a priority, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers, so forth and so on. The very last gift that he mentions in this list is the diversities of tongues. And most commentators will be careful to mention that this is interesting as Paul moves into chapter 14. He spends almost the whole chapter dealing with that gift, in particular, the diversities of tongues, which would cause us to think or, or assume that probably what they did was they would have at, inverted this list to an extent. That is, as, instead of seeing the apostles as the priority of God in gifting the body, in terms of their purpose and their function, what they were grasping after are these types of external manifestations. They wanted these gifts where, where they could be on a stage and be seen, such as the gift of tongues, of languages. They wanted to do something that was profound, that would cause men to actually look at themselves as they operate in this said gift. And Paul is saying, no, understand what God's priority is in giving the gifts. First and foremost, he gave us apostles. Well, why is that important that God would give the apostles as a priority? Well, if you think about it, there would be no church apart from the apostolic dispensing of that gift. There would be no you and I. There would be no gathering together in the 21st century. Men and women, believers all around the world coming together together under the cause of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from God in the person of Christ, choosing men, selecting men, sending men called apostles to lay and to actually become, as it were, the foundation, a part of the foundation of the church and to lay down the gospel and to give their lives for the cause of the gospel, preaching the resurrected Christ. This was upon the dispensing of the spirit. They were sent out and missions was going on where? Starting in Jerusalem and then in, in Judea, Samaria, and all the uttermost parts of the world. And now you and I in the 21st century, all the way over here in the West, in California, get to sit here and muse upon the glories of God. The same cannot be said in terms of, of, of the impact and the, and the, and the priority regarding the, the gift of tongues. God, God has given us the, the gift of, of tongues, as, of, of languages as a breakthrough gift to be able to break through, yes, the barrier, that language barrier, that cultural barrier, um, and, and I thank God for that. But what he, what he wanted to do is to correct their bad thinking because he understood what the root of their thinking was, that they were grasping after, after certain things, and what was 
what, was, what that was rooted in was not in the right motive, not in the right motive. And so uh, point B under, under point one, the pursuit of love, not only is Paul establishing the divine priority of gifting the body, but then he moves on to be able to, to, to really tell them um, this uh, in summary, to tell them that you, you really need to, to think about what you desire and why you desire it. So, and this is really, I'm drawing this by implication in the text, where he says here, he says, uh, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. And then he says in verse 31, but covet earnestly the best, the best yeah. gifts. So, 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 so by implication, he, he is, he's actually indicating something on their part, that there are some that may be truly uh, coveting after the best gifts, and some may be doing it for the right reasons, and some not for the right reasons. But, he, he, so he, but he's affirming that what you ought to do if you're a part of the church is to, yes, to covet the best gifts. Now, what he's not doing, what he's not doing is telling them to break the 10th commandment of, of covetousness. That term... Covet is the term zealous. It's the term zealous. And so, and so at, at the top of your outline, when I, when I say pursue love above all, what I'm getting at is, is really the nature of this term. The term covet that he uses here is the term that means be zealous for, be passionate for. Zeal is that thing, is that, thing that, that drives you. It drives you to pursue a thing. It moves you out into action. And he's saying, be zealous, passionately pursue the best gifts. And yet, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. So what Paul is getting ready to do in, in chapter 13 is to, is to show us what this more excellent way is. Your point two in your outline says the superiority of, love, superiority of love. And this is the proposition that love is to be valued over giftedness. Love is to be valued over giftedness. And this is, this is what I mean, that if we are a part of the, of the body of Christ, Christ's body as a whole is a gifted body. It is a charismatic body. God has given every member a specific gift or gifts, but there is a purpose for those gifts. And I just want to speak to a number of things that Paul is doing um, in chapter 13. Look at what he begins to do. Look at the care of Paul. I have Paul's care as he corrects. He's getting ready to move, move further in his correcting of their thinking about what it means to operate in a gifting. And he's saying, he, he, he is moving in a kind of poetic, rhetorical fashion. This is really a, a, a beautiful poem that Paul is moving into. He, he has a, a spirit, a spirit of God inspired poem that he's getting ready to set forth. And he's going to use this to actually correct them, to actually change their trajectory and say, look at the way that you're thinking. Do you see yourself? Do you see yourself? Do you see yourself? This is important. We, we, we do have to test our passions because because the, the world will tell us all day long that. As long as we're passionate about a thing, we should pursue that thing. Without a caveat, without any kind of um, a qualifier. But the Bible would check us and to say that you're sinful by nature. And because you're sinful by nature, your passions are bent towards a certain direction. And what you ought to do if you really understand that you are a sinner by nature, then, and especially if you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to be honest about that and, and understand that you actually need the help of God. You need his grace to even understand your own passions and even uh, understand your own motivations for why you pursue a thing. Isn't that true? So that's important for us to always, uh, to, to not assume 
that because we are passionate about a thing or we earnestly desire a thing, that it be good in and of itself. Well, the way that we get underneath what we are passionate about is to check our motives. It's to check our motives. And sometimes we don't quite clearly understand what our motivation is. And so God has to show us that uh, according to his word. And this is what Paul begins to do. This is what he begins to do. He's correcting their thinking, but I want you to see his care in the way that he does it. I see uh, in 1 Corinthians, I see a very caring pastoral Paul in 1 Corinthians. If you read it all the way through, you see he was very, very patient with the Corinthians. Very patient because the Corinthians were jacked up. They had a lot of issues and Paul had to deal with them and he took time to deal with each one and he was careful in the way that he approached them even, even to, to deal with them and approach them differently based on each specific topic that he dealt with, an issue that he dealt with. So here, look at what he does in verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 1. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, this is the term for love, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. You see that? It's kind of poetic in the way that he uses that, particularly in the King James Version. In the other versions, I believe, like the NIV and, and the ESV, uh, the though would be uh, exchanged for the, for the term if. Uh, so you could, you could read this as a, a conditional statement in a sense, but really what he's doing is he's speaking what we call hyperbole. And that in the, in, in the Greek, the term hyperbole is actually the term that he uses, that he uses in verse 31 of chapter 12, where he says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. That term excellent is the term hyperbole. Hyperbole. It is to go beyond. It is, it is that which reaches beyond. It is, it is, a, it is a, a superior term. It is a, a term of comparison to say that this is beyond measure. What you have been doing is you've been grasping after said gifts and said manifestations in your life in, 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 when you come to public worship. But you're not going about this thing the right way. Let me show you the right way to go about it. So he says, so then as he begins to go into this kind of rhetorical mode again, and he says, though I speak with tongues of angels, you could translate it as if I were to speak, if I had the ability to speak with the tongues or the languages of men or even of angels. See, so, so he's, Paul's thinking of the, of, the, of the extreme, the hyperbolic extreme that he can go to. You want to talk about gifts? Well, let's, let's, let's try to draw this out as large as we can, as extreme as we can in terms of what it would look like to be gifted. What if I was able to speak in this way, to speak with eloquence, to, to woo you, to draw you, to move your emotions so that you can go through every aspect of, of, of emotion, of, of passion, of consideration, and I could get you to move and to do something that I want you to do just with my words? What if I had the ability to articulate myself like that and I didn't have love? What would I be? You see, that's what he's doing. But, but here's the care. Here's what I like about it. This is just kind of a, a subtle thing. As he moves to correct them, he exchanges Corinth or those certain members of Corinth that had the wrong attitude and the wrong thinking and the wrong behavior. He exchanges them as the subject and he puts himself there and he says, what if I? What if I? That's kind of a, that's a subtle way, that's a rhetorical way of kind of, of, of kind of easing the ego of a person that is arrogant so that they can actually take the blow that you're about to give to them. Really, he's demolishing their understanding and their perception of things in a biblical way and in a, in a poetic way, in a beautiful way. He's saying, what if I? What if I, Apostle Paul, was able to do this? What if I? What if I? And he's getting them to consider themselves. So consider yourself as he says this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love or charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And um, 
This is the idea. The idea, when he says sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, he's not talking about those types of cymbals on, on the drums. He's talking about really like this, this, um, this odd sounding gong. Have you ever heard a, a gong being banged? Have you ever heard a gong being banged over and over and over again? So the picture is, is kind of the, the, the Greek theater uh, or, or some type of, of show where people would be prepared to actually hear something that would, uh, that would move them, that would do something for them. In this case, he's really dealing with the edification of the church, which is the purpose of the gifts. But he's saying, if, if, you, if you were expecting to, to, to get something from me, and all I did in my articulation of speech and my fanciful use of words was, was speak to you in whatever way that I speak to you without love, it's just like someone who would come out on stage and just start banging a gong. Bong, 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 bong. What do you get out of that? You would get nothing. A gong is what we call in music a monotone. It, it doesn't have any, any, any specificity in sound. And to merely bang a gong over and over again is to do nothing for your audience. It's not to help them or to edify them in any way. The only thing that you will get as a response is irritation. Right? If I just came out here and just bang, 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 you, you would just be like, okay, when is this guy going to stop? But what he's doing is he's painting a picture of what you're doing in the spiritual realm. When you essay to be uh, doing something on behalf of God, but you don't do it with the motivation of love. You're like the banging of the gong. It means nothing. It's just noise. It affords no one anything. Not, neither are they profited, neither are you. I've become like the banging of a gong. And though I have the gift of prophecy, verse 2, and understand all mysteries, you see the hyperbole? It's not quite possible that he could have the gift of prophecy and, and understand all mysteries. He's not omniscient, and he has not acquired that. He's using hyperbole, the extreme. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, you see, so that I could remove mountains. We've heard that from Jesus, right? We've heard that several times in scripture, the, the, the kind of faith that removed mountains. It's, 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 it's not a health, wealth, and prosperity uh, uh, line to get you. That's not what that is. That's a, it's, a, it's a Jewish, uh, it's a Jewish uh, proverbial saying. It's a Jewish saying uh, that speaks to this. It speaks to having the powers and the abilities to do something to make the impossible possible. He says, what if I had that ability? What if I had that kind of knowledge? What if I had that kind of faith? But yet I don't have love. I am nothing. See, he moved a little deeper there. He said, I am nothing. I am nothing if I don't have love. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, what are these? These are, these are the, the extremities of self-sacrifice. There are a lot of people in this world that have lots of resources, and they can do a lot of great philanthropic humanitarian things. But apart from the love of God, to God, that is, doesn't mean much. I can do all these things, and if I do not have charity, it profits me nothing. Nothing. So he moves forward in this, in this, uh, in this poem, in this poem. And he begins to then show them, having proved to them why they ought to pursue love, he begins to show them what true love actually looks like from verses 4 to seven in chapter 13. But here's, here's something that I just want to deal with before, before I get there because um, on your outline, I'm dealing with um, verses four through seven of chapter 13 on the, on the back side of your page. And you can see that there's a whole list of, of all of the attributes. It's 15 attributes, 
15 attributes that Paul lays out concerning love. When you think about the term love, do you think about 15 different attributes? It's amazing, amazing. Paul really thought this through, and the Spirit of God really dealt with him concerning love. And I just want to deal with this. Um, um, I added this to my outline as I was just kind of uh, thinking through this um, by implication, and I, I like to just set this forth. After uh, on point two uh, B, point two B, Paul's conviction about charity or love. Do you see that there? Paul's conviction. So we talked about the care that he has as he corrects them, but there's a conviction that he has. There's a conviction that he has about love. Paul's been persuaded about something concerning this thing called love. And I just want to just kind of kind of piggyback on what Pastor Jesse has been dealing with. And this is just what I've been thinking about um, and I just would like to just lay it out. Um, when we think about love, what, what we've been considering um, thus far, particularly in chapter 12, is love and the origin of love, right? The origin of love in God. And one of the main propositions, if you had listened to that study, that was set forth and that was dealt with um, extensively really good was this proposition that God is love. God is love. God is love. That's amazing, right? And we begin to think about what the scriptures have to say concerning our God, concerning the nature of God, concerning what we call theology proper, and dealing with the, uh, the revelation of God in terms of those three persons and what we, what we, I like this term, I like this term, the community, the community. The community of the Godhead, the community of God. That really is implied by this statement, God is love. It is the implication of the statement that there is a community, a community. When we are to think about God properly concerning the whole of New Testament revelation, we're thinking about a community of persons, right? So, so here, here's, here's what, what, what Paul's conviction is. Paul understands that what God has done, there in this community, there are two other words that I want you to see that are, that are um, a part of this root of community, okay? Community. Commune. Commune. I just, I just want you to think about this term, commune. But I'm going to add commune. I'm going to add this, this, pre, uh, this, uh, this suffix, communion. Communion. This community between the Father and the Son and the Spirit from all eternity. What it looks like for God to be love when you think of in your mind's eye the picture of God who is Spirit. You're thinking of a community of persons that from all eternity enjoyed communion with each other. Communion. A unity, a sharing, a partaking in. Are you following me so far? I'm going to show you some passages, but I just, I just want to lay these terms out. Communion, communion. But this communion, within this communion, within this community, this communion falls out to something further. It, it actually spills over into communication. Communication. A communication. And what I mean is this communion within the Godhead did not remain internal. What God had decided to do, what the triune God had decided to do, the Father, Son, and Spirit, within this eternal communion that they shared, was to communicate the reality of that love that they share to who? Sinners. Sinners. This communication happens 
to another entity called the church. And the way that this love of God is communicated to the church, to the church, how does this happen? By union with Christ. The son, the second person, is the, is, the, is the center focus, is the point man. He is the mediator. He is, he is that, that one by which the church is drawn into, drawn into the, the reality of the love of God. Let me show you a passage. Go to 1 John with me. I'm not saying much more than what Pastor Jesse has been saying. I'm just saying this in a slightly different way. But this is just a piece of the meditation that I've been um, stirred over as I'm looking at these attributes of love and how Paul is calling us to respond to a proper, to a, to a real legitimate knowledge, a real experience of God's love. If you'll turn with me to, um, to Actually, you know, yeah, 1 John chapter 4. We'll go to 1 John chapter 4. I want to take you to, to Ephesians as well, but 1 John chapter 4, we'll start there. Look at, look at with me at verse 7. I want you to see this. You there with me? Yeah. Okay. Look at what John says. John was, was overwhelmed just like Paul was with the love of God. He, he got it. He was drawn into, into the love of God. You know, let me just back up real quick to, to, to chapter one real quick, and then we'll, we'll go to chapter four. Look at what he said. He was so overwhelmed with this that, that he, he says this as he opens up. He says, verse one, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's speaking to, to that eternal son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is this life that he speaks of, not only in this epistle, but in his account of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, he says, for the life was manifested, was manifested and we have seen it. He's talking about the privilege that he, along with the rest of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, had to, to be thoroughly acquainted with what he calls the word of life. The word of life. Remember, Christ, the Son, who is the word of life, this word of life, is the point man. He is the point man by which, by which this love is communicated. To sinners who, who, for all intents and purposes, apart from this communication, are always on the outside of this experience. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father. Was he with the Father? Absolutely, from all eternity which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen, he says it again, that which we have seen. He's bearing witness, isn't he? That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. What is that? Communication. So, in the same way that there is a communion, a reality, that, that is experienced in the context of this community, this, this relationship. It spills over through communication to others that were on the outside of this. John is one of these who had the benefit of experiencing the manifestation of the life, the word of life, who brought him into this reality. And you know what's happening to John? He's seeing and experiencing the same thing in principle. And this is what we ought to experience as the church. We should experience a relationship of love amongst each other, together, in Christ, with God. And that relationship, only, that, that, that love only begins there. It only begins there in order to spill over so that we begin to communicate as well to others who are outside called the world. You got it? 
This communion that we have with God and, and with each other in Christ, this communication, we communicate it. We communicate it. We don't leave it. It doesn't, it doesn't end here. What we learn in these four walls should not, it should not terminate in us. It should not end there. We, we shouldn't be satisfied and content with, with receiving, 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 and it never spilling over into a kind of communication by word and by deed and by life and by attitude to others who are on the outside of this experience. If God has done this for us, should we not do this as representatives of God to others? Is that what we're called to do? Absolutely. Go ye into all the world. You see? So look at what he says then. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. You see? He wants them to join into the fellowship and the communion that they experience. And truly, our fellowship is with who? The Father. And with his son, Jesus Christ. That's good. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now, mind you, he is speaking primarily to believers. He's speaking to the church. John the elder is speaking as, a, as one of the last apostles alive. He's speaking to the church. But understand, he has to encourage the church. And he understands that not everybody amongst this group called believers, called the church, the Christian church of the Lord Jesus Christ, are saved and are actually experiencing this reality. But even the believer needs to be encouraged. And through the, communi the constant communication of the body... We continue to experience overtures of love from God through our connection with each other, through our relationship with each other, through our communion, through our fellowship with each other. This love is translated from every member to one another. As, just as air and, and blood flows from one part of the body to the next and all needs to be communicated to one another for every part, every member, every, every muscle, every, every part of the body to function correctly and properly, there has to be a constant communication between every member of the body. Not one piece, not one part is, is cut off from this communication and the need from a constant reverberation of what is necessary for all of us to live. So jump over to um, chapter 4. Look at what he says here. Uh, verse 7. He says, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. <laughs> there it is. If you don't have any other verse, there it is. Let us love one another. Who is he talking to? The church. Who are we to love? The church. So here's my proposition. Are you earnestly pursuing to love the church? Is that even our first thought when we think about the command to love. Because a lot of times we'll hear we ought to love the world. I'm not saying don't love the world. But what I'm saying is, first and foremost, do you see the necessity of God placing you in the body and equipping you with gifts, spiritual gifts, so that you might be a means by which love is communicated to the church. Because that's the purpose. It's one of the primary purposes for why God has given us gifts. They're not to terminate in ourselves. They're not for our pride. They're not for our own glory. They're for the edification and for the profit with all of the body to the glory of God and for the benefit of those that are connected to us. Look at what he says. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God. So, so here's another wonderful reason and real serious reason why we ought to consider this proposition of pursuing love. Because it's a manifestation, it's an evidence that we truly are born again. 
It's a manifestation. It's an evidence that we have truly been brought into the reality of the love of God. Having been made new creatures in Christ, been made his children, been, been, been given new life spiritually. And the spirit of God has poured the love of God in our hearts because Christ has truly redeemed us. It's an evidence. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. John just ups the ante, doesn't he? He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And he, and, and he continues to push the, the gospel redemptive picture of Christ being our propitiation, being the, the, the cross being the ultimate act of love. <clears throat> The ultimate demonstration on the part of God. Showing us what true love looks like. I really don't have time to go through all of the 15 attributes that Paul uh, lists in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. But let me just tell you, what Paul is doing is he's, he's painting a picture. He's painting a picture. This is how John MacArthur said it, and I like it, so I stole it. I acquired it. That's a better term. He says, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is painting a picture as a master artist. And he's sitting, and the object in front of him that he's looking at, for which he's painting this masterpiece, this poetic picture, this poetic masterpiece, is a person. And the person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I thought about it, I was pushed back on my heels, and I thought, wow, but what Paul is doing is much more than just drawing a picture of Christ. It's as it were rhetorically, he's drawing this picture and we know who it's supposed to be, right? We're believers. It's supposed to be Christ because when you look at these attributes in 1 Corinthians 13, <laughs> 4 through 7, you just look and you say, well, <laughs> that's not quite me. Just, just look for a second. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> you look at these and if you're honest, you're overwhelmed that that. Either you, your attitude doesn't look like this or your action um, doesn't look like this a lot of times. And, and so then you, you're, you're, you know, the only thing you can do, if you really know what to do, is to call on God and say, Lord, have mercy, right? And, and, and beg God to give you of his spirit, to, to grace you, to give you the strength, the ability to be able to demonstrate these things in your life because you know they're important. But look at what he says. He says in verse 4 of chapter 13, he says, charity or love suffers long, suffers long. In some other translations, it's to be patient. But, 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 but the way that, um, that this can be rendered really is, um, is to, to be long-tempered. It's, it's macrothumia. It's, it's this, this idea of having a, a long fuse. You're able to bear with people. You're able to bear and endure suffering, hardship, evil toward you. And, and then he says, and, and is kind. And, and kind, so, so suffering long is kind of, um, speaks more towards the, the internal uh, ability to be able to do this. But, but kind is, is the external outworkings of, of love in this sense that you're not repaying this evil or this suffering with evil back and suffering back and hostility back, but you repay this evil for good, with good. It's the term for useful. You, 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 you find ways to be useful. It means manageable. It, it's, it's, it's amenable. It's kind. It's, it's appropriate. It's, it's approachable. You're not going tit for tat, as the Lord Jesus would say. You learn how to turn the other cheek. You learn how to, how to give, give uh, the man that asks of you, not only give him your cloak, right, but give, give him your coat. You, you, you go with him a couple of, a couple of miles. You, you do the extra deed. You're kind. And then he says, charity does not envy. And charity does not vaunt itself. That is, it's not, it's not boastful. It's not boastful. It's not puffed up. It's not one, it, it, it doesn't look like one who is arrogant, who thinks uh, of themselves as more important. 
Therefore, it's willing and it's ready and able to suffer long because it's humble. Because it's humble. Love does not behave unseemly. It, it, it's, it's not rude. It doesn't seek its own. And Paul speaks to this in Philippians chapter 2. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, before he says that, he says, look, the, stop thinking about your own stuff, your own things. You actually need to esteem your brother above yourself and think about the things of others sometimes. Love, love doesn't look like that, that person who is so um, self-absorbed that they must fight for their rights. They must fight for and demand for those things that they think that they deserve. Love is counterintuitive in that way. Love is not easily provoked. That is, it is not, it is not um, uh, easily offended and moved to anger because of their own person. Jesus Christ was like this. When you saw Jesus Christ angry, it was not, it was not because of his uh, own personal offense to, toward himself. It was because his heavenly father was offended, because his heavenly father was rebelled against, was sinned against. He, he was zealous and he was, he was angry and he had righteous indignation, particularly to those um, that were religious rulers and those that claim to be the true worshipers of God and yet he understood that they were hypocrites and they blasphemed God and gave occasion for others to blaspheme him. He was jealous for the glory of God, not his own glory. It says love is not easily provoked. It, it thinks no evil. It thinks no evil. When, when we are when, when we are angered and we are provoked and we are offended, we are, ready, we are ready to think evil of a person. And to think evil is, a, is that, that term to, to, to think evil, it's, a, it's an accounting term. It's this, this idea of, of accounting something. It, it is it's to take record, to count it up. And he's saying love does not count offenses. Love does not keep a tally or a book of all the wrongs you did to me so that the next time you do something wrong, I can pull it out and let you know this is what you did to me. It doesn't keep offenses. Love is able to forgive. It's able to release. It's able to let go. It's able to reconcile. It's able to redeem. That's what love is able to do. It's able to overcome that, the offense. You see? Love does not rejoice in iniquity. It, it, it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. These attributes of love, these qualities, these characteristics of love look like the cross. In fact, they look like the entire life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It looked like the person and the work of Jesus on behalf of sinners and to the glory of God. That's what they look like. So when we, so, so when we consider that Paul is painting this picture, we, we might be kind of squirming in our seats because we're like, okay, well, I'm ready for him to finish this picture and show me. But when Paul shows me this picture, what he's really doing rhetorically is saying, look at this picture. Look at what love looks like. Is this you? That's what I think Paul is, is kind of doing. He's trying to get you to, to not only see the qualities of love, but to check yourself by these qualities. And to ask yourself, is this being manifested in my life? Does this look like me? And of course you're going to say, well, I'm not perfect like that. That's not the point. The point is that you know the one that is perfect like that. The point is you've been called by the one who is perfect like that. The Lord Jesus Christ, the point man, who's calling you into this love, who's calling you to be conformed to this. God's purpose is to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that as Christians, we are called to follow in his footsteps. So that this very same love is what we ought to see in some degree being manifested in our life toward each other and then to the world. And 
And this is what I mean about Paul's conviction, really. I want to read something from um, Mr. Charles Ellicott. He said this about, about this passage. He said, the apostle Paul had always been conscious of a mighty power working in him, mastering him and, and bringing him into captivity to Christ. There sudden, suddenly flashes upon him the realization of what that power is. And he cannot but at once give utterance in language of surpassing loftiness and glowing with emotion to the new and profound conviction which has set his whole soul aflame. This chapter, Mr. Ellicott says, is the baptismal service of love. We've been talking about being baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ, into his body. And Paul is eulogizing love. He's singing a hymn of praise of love. He's, he's, he, he is speaking in poetic form concerning the glory of love because he realizes that if we're a part of the church, we've been baptized into this reality. Therefore, we're called to commune together in this reality and to communicate this reality to everyone that is in our sphere of influence. This is why love ought to be the ultimate pursuit. Several of the verses that I have here, um, I feel like this is a good place to stop. I would encourage you to read um, some of those, those verses and those passages, um, particularly the ones that are in bold um, speak to um, the redemptive nature of these things and how they point to the Lord Jesus Christ so we could see this again in his life and in his death, how he communicated love towards sinners, towards sinners. And he communicated love toward his church, toward his church. This is what we're called to do. The last thing I want to say here is that this is, this is really um, what God has called us to do. I just want to go to Ephesians chapter 4. This will be the last passage I read. For, uh, if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I have a box in your outline under uh, point 2B, under uh, Paul's conviction about, about charity or love. And in that box... Um, there are other verses there, including some of the ones that, that we looked at. But what I was, what I was listing are some of the, the reasons why love is superior to seeking after some kind of giftedness or, or, or usefulness. It's not that they are opposed to each other. It's that love is the motivation by which we actually operate appropriately in a gifting that God has given us. Love is the motivation. Love is what moves us out appropriately to actually be useful. It causes us to be useful in the body. Apart from love, we're not useful. We're not useful. So I have the character of, of God and his children is love. That love is the central reality of the gospel. Love is the fulfillment of the law in Christ. Love is the preeminent fruit of the spirit of God. Love is the point of unity and witness in the church, Ephesians chapter 4. And I want you to look at that with me. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I'll start at verse 1. Look at what he says. He says, Paul, again, again, he was overwhelmed with love. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Walk worthy of the salvific calling. Walk worthy of the reality of salvation what you've been called to as the church. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. How? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. If we are operating in love, we will maintain the unity that has been established amongst the church. So we'll do. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he says, but unto every one of us is given grace 
according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So I, 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 do, I do think that this, um, this kind of phraseology of, of filling all things speaks to this reality too. That what, what, what Christ is doing, what God is doing in Christ is, is filling up this world. He's filling up everything, but the way, that he, the way that he is dominating, the way that he is filling all things is he's doing it through the church. He's communicating this love, this reality of grace, the, the reality of the victory that Christ has wrought by virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection on behalf of his elect. He's done it, and he's, he's secured salvation and redemption of everything. It's a matter of time. But this is unfolding throughout redemptive history, even now, through the reality of the church. And look at what he says. Verse 11, he gave some apostles, there's the priority, there it is, they're the foundation. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Do you see the priority of the body of Christ in the giving of the gifts? This is based on need. This is based on, on God's purpose to build up the body. And he equips the body through these gifts that he dispenses. He equips the body. He makes the members of the body instruments, useful instruments to communicate the love of God through the redemption that Christ has accomplished. Until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. So he's talking about growing up and maturing. That's really what it looks like if we get this thing called love. If we have experienced love and we are enjoying the communion of this love, of this reality, and God causes us to be communicators of this love amongst each other and then to the world, we're actually growing. And we're not growing uh, lopsided. It's not me growing more than you. It's not you growing more than me. It's the body is growing together, effectively and efficiently, together, as a body, together. The body's edifying itself in love. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men, the cunning craftiness, whereby they, light, they lay wait to, be, uh, in, uh, to, to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From, the, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. You see, he got the picture. Every joint, every part of the body is functioning in its role. And because they're doing what they're to do, what they're called and what they're designed to do, every other member of the body is benefited and able to function in a greater capacity than they would be able to apart from the functioning, the proper working and functioning of the other, other members of the body. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's what we're called to, brothers. That's what we're called to. And this is why our contemplation and our study of the love of God is something that um, should not be made light of. We should, we should continue to strive and to, and to, and to dig deep and to, and to go headlong into this reality and understand how this ought to impact us and affect us so that we can be the church that communicates to the world the love of God. Because that's what Christ prayed for in John 17. Read it. That's what he did. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
so we won't be long. That was, that was very good, wasn't it? Very good. Um, it's, always, it's always an important subject to deal with, um, the subject of love, because at the heart of it, as, as Michael was stating, and we have been talking about for a while, is the nature of God, the essence of salvation. Um, we're going to do a little Q&A before we shut it down. we got 10 minutes, um, so if somebody wants to run the microphone to see if you guys have any thoughts germinated by what was uh, said. Uh, not him. Not, no, no. You, no. Yeah. Thank you, though. You, you could, uh, one needed to be a little bit more responsible. Anybody? All right. So while Lou is about to say that, I, I want to share something probably that will help some of you around the subject of the love of God relative to your life. Because what Michael was dealing with is, is the area of motive, which is difficult for any of us. How do I know my motive is right when I do a thing? Um, is, am, I, am I really functioning out of a, a love for God or am I doing this for my own purpose, my own aggrandizement, my own goals? That's a critical question, isn't it? Right, so here's what I would say if you are kind of toddling on the fence with this issue of love, because it is like a sweater that has been stretched so far out of shape uh, by its overusage in our world. The love of God, the love of God, love, 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 love. Nevertheless, you don't want to lose the significance of that term, uh, only because of the danger inherent in doing anything apart from love, right? So even though the world is using the term in a wrong way, I don't want to use it the wrong way. I neither want to affirm or adopt a twisted view of love, nor do I want to, in arrogance, neglect that love. I definitely want to understand the love of God in a way that corresponds to God's revealed will to me in my life. Everything that Michael said relative to the functional aim of the love of God is important to you and I. Just to re remind you of a couple of things, critical things. If you and I are going to be useful to the glory of God at any level, in any way, it's going to be because we have grasped the functional aspect of that love. It's not going to be because we like inadvertently slipped into it. Is going to be because we have intentionally pursued a knowledge of God relative to the central character of God revealed to his creature, particularly in the matters of redemption by which he is bringing us into that community. That communion and community and communication that was talked about tonight, which I started with you guys a few weeks ago, is really something you want to learn. You want to really be able to grasp the concept of communion because that's what love is. A subject, object, relationship that is reciprocal in nature, always pursuing the highest good for the other. Does that make sense? That's called communion. Communicating that is the exertion or manifestation of that reciprocating love so that it goes out, which is another aspect of love definitively because love always gives right love always gives that's the nature of love this is how we know we are loving because we are giving for god so loved the world that he what so now the love of this triune god is now exhibiting itself in giving so the believer has been the beneficiary of that that gifting and now that you have been endowed with that same communion and have been exercised in that same communication base, you also now want to give love. And if I will, I'll keep it on the track of the, the redemptive paradigm. The, the, one of the most uh, significant areas in which you want to be able to demonstrate that love, brethren, is in how you communicate. Remember that. One of the first and foremost areas in which I want to be able to 
walk in the love of God practically is how I communicate. That is the gift that he gives you and I on an evangelical level that will most readily bring men and women into an awareness of who God is in Christ. So if my words are shaped and formed by a motive of love that's rooted in a revelation of the glory of God in Christ, then I am going to be leaning into and inclined towards making sure that when the door opens for me to talk to people, it's going to be shaped towards helping that individual see Christ more clearly or see him all together. So communication for the believer is redemptively manifested in our being evangelical in nature, right? Does that make some sense? That kind of gets you out of the sort of uh, weird uh, emotional and psychological concept of love, but still going back to it on a more, on a more practical level when we talk about love and how it's going to work itself out, just take this concept down. It, in my mind, I was thinking, how do we actually grow in this love and exhibit this love in a way that, that the scriptures are mandating? Well, I'll call this the death life dynamic. The death life dynamic. The one thing that's always impeding our ability to do what's right is our sinful nature. The one thing that's always impeding our, our desire to do what's right is our sinful nature. So what Michael was talking about in terms of the love of God is centrally manifested as well as communicated to us sinners through Jesus. So when we talk about if you don't have love, you don't have anything. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. Is that true? Well, really, you could say if you don't have Christ, you don't have anything. That makes sense, right? But I want to expand that term a little bit larger as Paul has given it to us on the more dynamic level. If we don't have Christ and him crucified, you don't have the love of God. Right, so, so view Christ not just in terms of the person, but the work. The work. And, right, and, and so I'm getting into how we get beyond just a kind of rhetorical expression of love that's just lip service. If I'm going to overcome my impulse to be selfish and overcome my impulse to think about me first, then I have to embrace the death aspect of the gospel in order that the love aspect of the gospel might be able to execute itself through me. I have to understand that there are areas in which I have to die. Sorry, that's the part I have to bring to you because I know that this is really the key. I actually know this is the key, right? It's not just the rhetorical terminology of love. God in, the, in his prerogative and power brought us into that love sphere. But where it begins to work itself out in our life is through the cross. This is what Paul meant when he says in Galatians 2.20, the Magna Carta of his life is, I've been crucified with Christ. That's the secret that he's saying for him to be able to exhibit the love of God in a manner where he didn't care about himself, but all sorts of other people and also his usefulness. Right? So if I'm going to be useful, and we should all want to be useful, I'm going to have to be committed to dying. Did you guys hear what I just said? If I'm going to be useful, if I'm going to be useful beyond where I am, or if I'm going to even be useful where I am, because this is a good opportunity for us gentlemen to think something through. Let's say, for instance, we're doing something for God. And, and I, would, I, would, I would recommend that you get the women's uh, series this morning that we did in our women's DOG, Daughters of Grace, because this morning we talked about service. And really, it's, 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 it's a complementarian subject relative to where we are. And we talked about how service for God is only really accomplished where the motive is right. Right. So what I am saying here is that as Michael was giving us the tail end of the uh, study about um, the community of the triune God drawing into its communion the church. And then the church bearing record to the world, the reality of God, as you're going to hear tomorrow. This is how they will know you are my disciples if you have love one towards another, right? Right, right? right. So, I, I, 
if I were a novice in the faith, here's what I would know about that. This matter of me loving my brothers and sisters in Christ is serious. If I were a novice in the faith, I would know that I am not going to be able to confidently affirm that when people look at my life or ask me anything about God, that they will know if I haven't committed myself to the fundamental intramural labors of loving my brethren. Does that make sense? Right. Otherwise, we're just church. So I, I'm pressing that home to you, gentlemen, because this is a really good uh, point at which we can reevaluate what we do on a daily basis. I wouldn't want any one of you nor myself to stand before Christ on the last day and him say, I don't know you. In fact, I never knew you. I never knew you. I don't want him to do that for any of us. And yet that text sits there right there, smack dab in the middle of eternity in hell or heaven for us to reckon with. Right? So you have this concern about, you know, working out our salvation in fear and trembling along the lines of love. So what I would like for us brothers to do is to be communing with God on the level of asking God to give us the grace to be able to die to selfish motives and selfish actions and selfish agendas and selfish goals and selfish aggrandizements because we can be deceived by our pseudo fruit and pseudo labors and we can deceive others down here. We can deceive others. We can, we can really pass off as doing the will of God when in fact we may not be doing the will of God at all. And this is what Paul meant when he talked about a sounding brass, a tinkling brass and tinkling cymbals and sounding brass, just making a bunch of noise, right? So I want to stay at um, just this point and then we'll take a few and get out of here. Remember, this is a death life dynamic. It's a death life dynamic. Suppose there are some limitations that you're dealing with, you. Because God, you know, he gives us an awareness of our limitations. Suppose there are areas in our life where we know we have not overcome, where we have not been able to exceed the boundaries of those things that have impeded us so that we execute the will of God in certain areas. Let's say it's in relationships. Let's say there are relationships with persons or people with whom you and I are shamefully uh, regretful of the fact that we have not executed a, a righteous response in that situation when it's due. You and I want to ask God for grace to die in order that the life of Christ might grant us the ability to overcome in that situation. Because that's the only way it's going to happen. It's not going to happen by you just adoring the idea of loving. It's not going to happen. So the love that God commends to us is the person and work of his son. Right? Y'all tracking with me? Right, so there are going to be assignments in your life that in order for you to actually execute those assignments, you're going to have to return to communion with God and assure yourself that you actually believe in Christ and him crucified and that your baptism into that love was also a baptism into that death so that the life of Christ might be manifested in us in an area by which God would expand our influence. So over the last several years, I've been exploring this in my own walk because I, I can't tell you guys to do something that I don't do. So over the last several years, I've been exploring how to proclaim and preach and, and communicate the gospel here at Grace in a way that not only is doing what Ephesians 4 says do, building up the body, uh, edifying itself so that the increase is evident, but also spills out into the world. Right, so I've been laboring personally on how to maintain a faithful ministry of expository preaching, sound, exegetical, expository, Christ-centered preaching. And you can tell me if I'm wrong. I think that we are very well known in all the Bay Area for being radically Christocentric. Right, so you got a stubborn pastor who is committed to being guilty, as Charles Spurgeon said, of preaching too much Christ. That's what I want. 
but I also wanted to have the uh, fulfillment of the promise of spilling out into the world so that you and I are not gospel Pharisees. Having a name that we're alive but dead. Right. Do I have your attention for a moment? So here's, here's what I have to do. I have to die to certain fears. I have to die to certain anxieties. I have to die to certain uh, threats and allow myself to be placed in situations by which if the enemy wanted to, he could accuse me of things. Do you hear me? I could easily just stay in the pocket and just preach to the choir. But doors open up to go here and doors open up to go there and opportunities to preach yonder occur because probably because I'm actually taking this love thing a little bit more seriously and allowing it to spill out into communities that are not like us. Do you hear me? I'm allowing it to spill out to communities that are not like us. And, and, and I don't say that in any arrogant way. What I'm saying is I have intentionally labored for years now before God with the objective of the growth that I have presented to us over the last couple of years, Lord, increase our faith. I, I have actually gone before you in my own walk wanting to explore what it looks like to be clear on Christ and him crucified, but ready to commend him to every man, to every man to every man and then to see how God would keep me in those communities and spaces and areas where people are not as grounded or solid in Christ as we are and, and the vulnerable elements that come along with it. You guys understand what I'm saying? So just the other day I was in a race relations conference. How many guys knew about that? How many guys heard it? A race relations conference. That's a death life dynamic if there was any most pastors would avoid that subject like the plague so I said when I was asked to do it I said okay here's a good opportunity Lord for me to die Right, and let people think what they want our pastors caught up in the politics or caught up in the this or caught up in the that no, it was just what Michael was saying. That when your communion with God is rich and rooted, it's going to emanate like Mary's anointing of Christ emanated and offended everybody that wasn't ready to be guilty of loving on Christ too much. Right? Because once that aroma goes out, they're going to say, hey, would you come over here? So I was at a big church last week as the central speaker in a community that doesn't really have the gospel at the level we do. And I just preached Christ. I mean, I just put him out there like you guys get it, right? But it was because I was willing to die to certain anxieties and, and accusations and, and phobias and fears that would come with people who would say, hey, they play blues over there. Okay, what else? See what I'm getting at? Because those, those are the traps and hindrances in the church where we are not operating out of love. So if we have the vision that the goal is that the, the Godhead has a community into which he's drawing us, and we are in that community through baptism, and we understand that it's designed to create an edification among ourselves that increases the body, hence 2,000 years later, Christians all over the world, and we're part of it. How do we continue to facilitate that prophecy forward until Christ comes, but to let the death life dynamic of the gospel work itself out in us so that Christ in you, the hope of glory, 
becomes the realization of 1 Corinthians 13. Christ in you. Because that's really what Paul was painting. He wasn't just painting Christ. He was painting Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's true. And what it's going to do is, is force you to struggle with leaving comfort zones and engaging at the level of believing the gospel will work as a witness, if not as a, a tool of conversion for people that are not like us. Am I making some sense? Good, 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 good. So I'll let you resonate with that. A couple questions, we'll wrap it up. Who has a mic? Big Lou. Is it on? Is it on? Uh, Pastor, maybe you can help me with this, but the, the mixed emotion of love and fear that I have uh, in a harmonious way with, with, with Christ and God the Father is likened to when I went to school, I was more fearful of, of being punished by my mother than I was the principal or the teacher because there was a certain uh, code and ethic of behavior that she expected me to exhibit uh, that was in line with her teachings to me that she expected me to act out when I was away from her. So I didn't want my school teacher or the principal called her back saying, hey, this guy's not acting like that. Because, and I, so I didn't fear them. I did fear them, but nowhere near the amount of fear that I, that I had for my mother. So I was more inclined to try to make a deal with them or what could I do so that this would not get back to my mother. Uh, you know, maybe I could do something that, that you know, I stay after school, do anything, fill the books, anything, so it doesn't get back to her. And, I, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there's so many people now who, I mean, Christian people who are fearful of what the government's doing and, and what the, the, the end times, uh, the, 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 we, you know, a, a, a meteor could hit the earth and all this stuff. And they, they seem to be fearing that more than they're fearing the, the God himself. I have such a fear of God and Christ and in terms of trying to live a Christian life and uh, trying to 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 be uh, to to do what he would like me to, to exemplify the life that he wants me to exemplify versus what the government's doing or what anybody's doing or any threat of some meteor hitting the earth. I mean, it's not even close because. I'm more concerned of trying to live like Christ wants me to live and do what He wants me to do. I, I can you kind of articulate what I'm trying, what I'm trying to bring forth in this? No, I got you. Um, anybody else have an observation? Anybody else? Okay, so then we'll wind it down after this. You don't have to talk just to talk. I ain't just. I don't want you to just run off at the mouth. But make sure you got a, a legitimate contribution. Don't mind that. Um, let me say this about what Big Lou just stated. <clears throat> Big Lou actually is talking about uh, um, an aspect of uh, the messianic attribute that um, distinguished Christ from all of the other teachers and prophets and preachers, and that is godly fear. So if you read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, you'll discover that there are seven characteristics, not now, in your own time, seven characteristics that were attributed to Christ when he was on earth. And one of them was called the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, I want to take that attribute and put it over to the right. Then I want to take another attribute and put it over to the left only to distinguish between the two as two sides of the same coin. They are not the same. They are two sides of the same coin, and they function with different purposes. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is the grace and attitude that we want from God to not do the wrong thing. 
The spirit of love is what we want in order to do the right thing. I want to do what's right from love and I want to not do what's wrong from the spirit of fear and reverence for my God because that is a messianic attribute that underscores my honor for him. But I don't want the spirit of fear to be the fundamental drive of my life because all it will help me do is not do certain things. But there are things I want to do. I want to be able to press into the frontiers of people groups and relationships better than I have over the last 38 years in Christ. And it's only going to happen by love. Because love casts out every kind of fear that would impede you and stop you and give you reasons not to do it and give you arguments to bail out and give you excuses not to engage. Right? But if the love of God in Christ allows me to maintain this radical Christocentristic concept of the death life dynamic, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. If it requires death, then I got to die to something in order that the life of Christ might engage me in that thing or that assignment that will bring God more glory. This is what I want to keep before your eyes. I am sure that the thing that keeps us from moving in obedience is the fact that we're not dying. I am sure that there are situations and circumstances and events where God could use us there, but we haven't died yet. You guys understand what I'm saying? And, 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 and I mean, this is, a, this is a dynamic death. I'm not talking about a philosophical or theologic, theologically articulated concept. I'm talking about coming up on a situation and knowing I really should be assertive in the will of God there, but I can't. And the reason I can't is because I'm stuck on self and my own reputation and my own ego and my own feelings, which 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Verse 8 gave us affirmative attributes and negative attributes. It said what love is and what love is not. What love does and what love does not do. It does not rejoice in evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. It does not rejoice in wrong. It does not hold accounts, right? Remember it said that? Right. So love does some things and love does not do certain things. And if I'm able to hold that list of Christocentric Christ crucified attributes together appropriately, then I'm going to be able to employ those attributes at the right time. Why is it that I don't want to have that conversation with that individual? Is it because I'm holding account of evil against that individual? or that people group, or that church, or that denomination? Am I holding them hostage? Have I hid the cross from them and from myself in order to not build a bridge between us and them and have the conversation? Am I making some sense? Because when Michael said he wasn't going to do it, but he did it, which was the right thing to do, lightly touch on those characteristics Love does not hold accounts of evil. We can do that so subconsciously and not realize that we haven't taken the forgiveness of the cross, applied it to ourselves, and applied it to them as a premise to begin talk talking. I'm making some sense. Even though you guys don't want to affirm it, I'm making some sense. Right, and this is what I mean by dying. This is what I mean by dying. There are I, I guarantee you, if you guys think through what I'm talking about, for what I'm saying to you is alien to you. Just think it through. And I'm going to pray that if you, if you don't get what Pastor is saying right now, that tomorrow, or maybe even tonight, God will bring a situation to your head and you'll go, yep, he's right. There's just areas I'm not dying in. I'm way comfortable with my life. And I don't want that to be, I want you and I to be able to win somebody that we don't like. Am I making some sense? What were you going to say, brother?
illustrates what you're talking about. Uh, well, I don't know if I need to be mic'd. Yeah, keep, keep talking. Keep talking. Trying to edify the brothers. Yeah. Uh, I have a mother-in-law. My dad lives away, and and, and uh, this woman, it's, this dear lady, she's a dear soul, but she's dementia. She has dementia, severe dementia. Can't remember what happened a minute ago. And she was driving me crazy when I was down there because I had to spend a number of days with her because she's she. She's constantly trying to get you to do her trip. Because Got it. Because that's all she has left is her will. Yep. yep. And and I was I went through a you know it, it's like um, Groundhog Day where uh, it, the world is new every one or two minutes. Yep. And so she just keeps coming and coming. And I tried everything in the world to deal with this, and I finally realized that I was I was handling it. You know she she's pushing me around. She's telling me what to do, she's this, she's that, she's the other. And, and I was operating in the way of Cain. Yeah. I was operating in terms of, I was not operating in terms of dying. I was not, and, and finally, I, I, uh, I don't remember what scripture, but you know, I, I just went to my Bible, you know, because she was just driving me nuts. And uh, the scriptures were there, and what the Lord showed me was, uh, and this probably sounds so goofy, but just, you know, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever yep. things are true. Philippians 4. Good That's right. Think on yep. these things. So God said, you know, think of the things about my life, which are a blessing, you know, because she can do certain things. And, and so I began to just address her as a queen. Yeah, yeah. Address her. As though she were the most precious thing. Yeah. Here's a woman who you can't have a conversation with. I had a conversation with her for 45 minutes about the Lord Jesus and the scriptures. And, and it is as though God restored her mind. That's right. That That's time. right. That's right. And it was because I, God showed me through his precious word how to put on yeah. Christ. Right. In this situation. Right. It was the devil was using the devil. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. And it was such a ministry to my unsaved dad, yeah. who was in just in constant warfare with her. Yeah. And it was it was powerful. And he began to, you know, he wanted to go to church with me. See? He wanted the pastor to come over. See? And so, you know, again. You See? Know, it was Simple. Just, just the word of God is so powerful and so simple. Yeah. But we have to die. Yeah. No, simple, simple term. I appreciate that, brother. Simple. That, and the only reason I'm really pressing what I'm saying is because I definitely know that we all have that in our lives on these micro uh, circumstantial levels. And if we don't, if we if you, if you don't want to talk, you can go head on. We ain't we haven't shut it down yet, brother Ted. But but we, I did, did need, need him to say what he said. That was edifying. Was that edifying? Very much so. Um, um, yeah. So you see what happened to our brother? God actually allowed him to transition from the carnal, fleshly, me-centered, self-centered, limited person who was ready to turn into a devil. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? With a person who has no ability to do anything but, but get on your nerves. Now, you guys were, how many of you guys were here last Sunday? So remember we're in John 13. And our master changed clothes, didn't he? And began to wash the feet of 12 men, including the devil. Including the devil. This is what I'm talking about. And I told you that was a what? A hoople dime. Did I tell you that? I told you it was a hoople dime, not a paradigm, a hoople dime. We're going to be back there tomorrow. Because the only way the disciples became the 12 foundations to the church is walking through that hoopadine. Now, either we're going to walk through it or we're not. And just for you, there was one fellow who said, the hell with this hoopadine. Do you know who he was? And we're going watch to watch him crash and burn tomorrow. Okay, and here how here how here's how gracious your Savior was to him. He said, "If you follow this example, 
you can make it too. Didn't he give it to him? He gave everything to the 11 that he gave to the one. This is how equitable the love of God is in Christ, even to a devil. He gave the devil the same exit strategy, the same hoop of dime. The devil said to hell with it. But here's the reality, brothers. There is no other way. There's, this actually is the only way. Okay? This is actually the only, the only way that we're going to experience the power of Christ in our life is to actually humble ourselves at that level and walk in that hoop of dime that love is able to actually execute in our life. So I don't want this to just be kind of academic for us. I want this to actually take on the life that it promises relative to people we haven't reached yet. There's somebody you guys haven't reached. There's somebody you haven't reached. That's why it's always only about 20 men in here. Did you guys hear what I just stated? That's the reason why. That's the reason why. And maybe if we are willing to take this on and God graces us and opens it, do you know what would happen? What would you think if we said, Lord, let this, what we heard Michael talk about tonight, be a reality in my life at the level of practical impact so that we look up and by the new year, God has expanded our capacity to reach some other man, some other brother who needs this kind of class. Am I making some sense? Right? Ted. I was just thinking about the, uh, what you were saying, uh, the summary of what Michael was saying, and I was thinking about the uh, sixth chapter of Romans, um, verse 16, where it says, Whom you yield yourself serve to obey, uh, to him who serves you all. Yep, it's right there. And like you were saying, you yield to it, you die yourself, to the thing. And you put it to the put it in there. And uh, that, that's what Christian growth is all about. Yep, totally. Yielding to what God has already put in it. What what God has already taught us through the word, through the teaching of the word, knowing for sure that it's in us, that Christ is in us, and all this is Christ's love in us. You yield to all those that's so true. I would, I would remind us, and we're going to close here. Uh, Ted did what our hearts should do that know the scriptures, and that is attach a text of scripture to our exhortation. He's quoting Romans 6, 18. But I would remind you that the first imperative in the book of Romans is our subject again, because you really can't get away from it. It's Romans 6, 11. Memorize it by heart. 200 something plus verses from Romans 1.1 1, 1 to Romans 6.11 before God tells us to do anything he shows us the glories of the gospel the reprobate world the damned the legalist the self-righteous person who will never make it in and then he tells us in the 6th chapter know ye not as many of us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ that in the same fashion in which he died, we also died. And even as he rose again, we should also walk in newness of life. And then he says, therefore, understanding the death life dynamic that I'm talking about, that you are to reckon yourselves indeed dead unto sin, but alive unto God the Father through Christ Jesus. That's a reckoning. That's what we do. We start with the reality that I'm in union with the Savior in a death life dynamic so that I have to grow in my faith in not being afraid to die. And I want you to define death in areas in which your carnal man seeks to preserve itself from an assignment that God may be willing to give you to reach somebody 
Remember communication, right? Love, I want you to get this, love for you and I men is chiefly, not exclusively, but chiefly in how we communicate the gospel. That's how love works for us. Otherwise, we don't mess it up. If we just talk about hugging people and going kumbaya, that's not going to work. I'm talking about how our hearts have to be geared towards looking at a soul, recognizing the imago day, recognizing that what they need is for me to communicate the love of God to them in Christ so that that love would draw them into the community just like it drew us. Let's stand for prayer. So, Father, we are so thankful for the message we heard tonight. We are also thankful. We, we are thankful for what you have taught us for 20 years at Grace. We're very mindful of the darkness of religion and the darkness of our secular world system out there. We're very mindful of the fact that you have given up many churches, given them plain up to just a worldliness and self-centeredness and a... And a, and a, and a, and a carnality and, and, and a humanness to where everything is about them. We're, we're very mindful of that. But we take no comfort in it at all. None. It means nothing to us. We could perish right along with them. And so we ask, Lord, that to whom much is given, much is required, that you would uh, grace us to, um, to pursue you and to pursue love at the level of it uh, positioning us to actually do things that are a little bit out of our comfort zone. We actually, we actually want to follow you like the disciples did. They followed you. It was remarkable. We know that they were bumbling and falling all over the place. And, and we do too. But they just kept following you. They followed you all the way to the tree. That's what we want to do. That's what you've called us to do. And you called us to join you in your death. And you promised to raise us again. Even as you did it 2,000 years ago, even as you did it at our conversion, we pray that you continue to do it as you told us. If you are my disciples, you will continue in my word and the truth. You will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we want to actually continue in your word. So I'm asking that you bless every brother here tonight with that message and that you bless every brother that is listening and watching with the same so that we might continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you and abound in the Christocentric Christ crucified love that is able to die and live again for your glory and we pray it all in Jesus name amen bless you brothers y'all let's get on out of here let's not delay and remember don't come back next week <laughs>